Shams, let's just start from the beginning. Growing up in Chicago, uh, when did you fall in love with basketball? I, I love the game, and and for me, I loved playing it, but then also just watching the Bulls growing up, you know, the 0405 Bulls with Ben Gordon and Kirk Heinrich, th that Luol Deng, that's really where my love and passion for the grit of the game came. And then once I started playing, I loved the game even more. So my passion has always been twofold in that, you know, I loved playing and then also loved watching, you know, NBA hoops. And something about the NBA always captivated me even more so than college or um, high school basketball. Like I loved the professional at the highest of levels. And so, um, you know, I, I loved the game. And then as I continued to, to go through middle school and high school, I also developed a passion for writing. And, and for me, um, at, at junior year of high school, you know, once you get cut playing basketball at, at, at the high school level, you know you have to move on. And so for me, it was all about finding out how else I can stay close to the game. And so for me, it ended up being, you know, combining writing and basketball passions. You know, I, I want to start here because a, a day after Kobe's passing, you voiced a, a very powerful video essay. And I just want to read an excerpt to kind of get the ball rolling here. Quote, you inspired work ethic and passion, commitment and drive in basketball and life. You inspired a young kid from immigrant parents to dedicate to life, to work, to, as you said, the grind. What was the grind like for you, Shams? The grind was, you know, driving to Indianapolis in the middle of the night and, and coming back home at four or five in the morning and having a finals exam the very next day. It was, you know, spending off nights and, and uh, weekend days, days where people might have been spending you know, hanging out with friends or partying or um, doing extracurricular activities. It was going to catch a game in Milwaukee or, or driving the extra three and a half hours to go see a game in Indianapolis and then driving three and a half hours back on a weekend. Um, you know, for me, I think that was like the early, you know, quote unquote grind because it was time that, you know, a, a lot of my peers, you know, I guess, you know, you, you wanted to live, right? You wanted to be a high school student uh, and, and, and really enjoy yourself. But for me, you know, I already knew where my focus was at, what I wanted to do. And so I was going to pursue that fully. And so the grind for me was identifying what I wanted to do and just continue to push, uh, push toward it like every single day. I think perseverance is probably that, that number one virtue that uh, when you're pursuing a, as big a dream as you were and what you're currently in, you have to persevere. You have to go through some, some tough patches where maybe there's some self-doubt. Maybe there's like, all right, man, there's a lot of people that want to do what I want to do. How do I separate myself? Uh, how did that perseverance in your teenage years going through college really prepare you to, to where you are today? I mean, perseverance definitely prepared me because, you know, you know, as you go, go and start in the industry, you're not going to get a bunch of yeses. At the, at the beginning, it's a lot of cold reach outs because, again, I didn't have any connections to the industry. So, so for me, all my connections were new from, from, from jump and I had to really, you know, prove myself. And no one, you know, when you reach out to people, no one asks how old you are, right? Yeah. You know, you, you kind of just have to have to show them your maturity that you can be trustworthy. You have to show them who you are as a person and then hope, hope that they, they buy it and that they, um, that, that they really, um, that, that you can sell people on who you are as a person, even though you might lack in experience in age in you know, having the following that, you know, some of your, your idols might have. So for me, um, you know, you know, starting out the perseverance was definitely important because you're, I got a lot of no's, you know, the Bulls, when I first, you know, I'm, I'm a native Chicago kid, right? So uh, when I wanted to cover the Bulls in uh, late in high school and early in college, uh, I wasn't allowed to, the Bulls turned me down. I was told no. And so to get a rejection from the team in your backyard was tough, but then that's what opened my eyes to the Milwaukee option, to the Indianapolis Sorry. option. And that was for me, if I, if I couldn't do the, you know, if I couldn't make it through the first door, I was going to try to see if there was another door to the finish line. You mentioned idols. Who were some of those idols in the broadcasting and NBA writing world that, that you idolized as a teenager? For me, um, I, I loved reading and, and really consuming as much content as I possibly could. And locally, a guy like Casey Johnson who wrote a lot about the Bulls. How was it balancing trying to get an education versus really pursuing your passion, knowing that like th those life experiences are really going to propel you to where you want to go? Uh, 
Yeah, it, it was it was tough. I I wasn't the greatest student, and and for me, the biggest thing was once I figured out what I wanted to do, I felt like experience was the greatest teacher, and and you know, being in those classrooms wasn't always the experience that I wanted, and there were multiple, mo you know, there, there was you know at least at least once a month there was a, there was a uh, a, a class or, or a time where I had to, I just stepped out for 20 plus minutes, 30 minutes. And, you know, I would come back and I would get these weird looks. And, uh, and I think really maybe one person, maybe a friend that I had in the class knew exactly what I was doing or what I was trying to do, but no, you know, for, for the vast majority of it, no one really knew. And the teachers didn't really even know. Um, so for me, it, it, it was, it was difficult. Like I, I, I can't even, you know, I, I can't even lie. Like for me, it was, uh, you know, I think I was barely passing. I, I don't even know how I passed, but the goal was to just get a degree. I feel like I got a degree. I did feel I learned different lessons uh, through different classes. But um, for me, my greatest teacher was always experience. And I think that's the, the greatest teacher in life. And you were getting reassurances from people around the league that that have been in the industry for a long time, that you were on the right path. Uh, how reassuring was that for you to know that, uh, you know, some of the, the mentors in your life that were in the place that, that you wanted to be were, were saying, hey, keep going, you're doing the right thing. That, that validated me because, you know, when you're on those long drives in, in Milwaukee and Indianapolis and, you know, you're driving home at four or five in the morning, you know, you have a final exam the next day or you have, you know, you, you have assignments the next day, you have the real, real life schoolwork that you have to, they have to do at 18, 19, 20 years old. But to get, re, like you said, reassurances and the validation from, from people that I looked up to at the time, that was, that's what kept me going. That's what allowed me and gave me the confidence to keep pursuing the dream. Because um, if, if I wasn't getting those reassurances, you know, there were moments that I was doubting myself, like, what am I even doing? Am I doing this the right way? Like, I, am I wasting my time? So you get those questions in your head constantly. So if, if it weren't for those reassurances, I probably wouldn't be where I am um, in terms of continuing to pursue what I want to pursue. And you were breaking stories, 10 day contracts, but January 6, 2014, I believe that was the, the day of your first big scoop. Did your homework. Yeah, and tell, tell me what it was, Shavs, and tell me what the feeling was after it became official. Yeah, so Luol Deng going from the Bulls to the Clippers in January of 2014, um, and, uh, you know, former Laker Luol Deng. Um, but, you know, he, he, you know, for me, that was a connection I had built uh, with the person that gave me that story, but that was a connection we had built, like, you know, 500, 600 emails. And so for me, uh, you know, getting that that email or, or text message or whatever it was at the time that, you know, that he was getting moved from Chicago to Cleveland. Um, it was real late at night. I remember it was sitting in my inbox for about, you know, it went on red for about 20 minutes. And so in today's day and age, breaking news, if you're not seeing it within, uh, forget 20 minutes, if you're not seeing it within 20 seconds, you probably already That's lost right. out on the story. So for me, seeing that message and 20 minutes later, reporting it. I just remember I, I went immediately on Twitter and I saw that it wasn't out and I put it out and uh, I was breaking 10 day contracts, European deals, G League deals, but to finally break through and, and, and break, you know, probably one of the signature trades uh, or, you know, at that point in the season. Um, I think it, you know, again, it just provided me with more validation and even more motivation. Like the next day I was driving to Milwaukee to go interview Clay Thompson. So for me, it was, um, you know, just you, and any amount of goals or, or things that you feel like you reach, just it, just know that it, it continues. Like the like the work and the goals, the expectations, like for, for yourself, they just you continue to set them, and once you surpass them, you just keep going. And you kick doors down, right? You you weren't able to break through that Chicago Bulls door at first, but you break stories like that. Come on in, Shams, right? <laughs> yeah, I actually did a freelance piece for ESPN um, in uh, in. Damn, I'm, I think it was that same year. Yeah, so I, I think I, I did a freelance piece for a major outlet that same year, and 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 around that time I was able to go back into Bulls games, and um, yeah, thankfully I, I got lucky. This generation of basketball fans, Shams is their guy, right? They have their notifications on Twitter set up for you. They're reading your stuff on, on the Athletic. Uh, you know, nine, ten years later. Do you ever think about that? That there's a new generation of fans that, that Shams is their guy? 
Yeah, I mean, it's fun. Like, you know, I, I'm in a lot of ways, I feel like I relate to that younger fan right now, that fan base of, of you know, whether it's 16, 15, 14, um, you know, even going into their 20s, because I was that fan at one point. Like, I was, like, obsessive over, you know, content, over the news, over, you know, second-to-second, -second, minute to minute updates, because, you know, as a kid, I was also refreshing, at the time, Real GM and Hoops Hype, and Twitter wasn't around in the mid-2000s, but I was you know, I was basically doing what, what a lot of people do now, which is, you know, you scroll through your Twitter feed or you scroll through Instagram. Um, but back then it was like refreshing hoops hyper, refreshing real GM. And that's how I consume my news. And so if, if I had an outlet like Twitter available, I would probably be on, I would have been on that 24 seven uh, when I was, you know, in, in middle school and going and, you know, in high school. So I feel like I can relate to the everyday fan. I feel like for me, I understand the thirst and the, and the, and the desire for information. And obviously that's what drives me to this day. I want to know what's going on before anyone else does. And so for me to be able to provide that to people that I feel like I, I was in their position uh, probably a decade ago, it, it just continues to drive and motivate me. I mentioned Kobe at the top, that mentality that he had, how much was that in your life when, when you talk about trying to fulfill a dream? I, mean, I know you interviewed him in El Segundo I believe it was 2017. Um, how much did he mean to your life, Shams? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he meant a lot. Um, I think Kobe did mean a lot to my life, but also a lot of people's lives, right? Because you didn't need to know him to, to understand and grasp his work ethic, his grind, how relentless he was. And, and um, you know, his mentality could really be used in any line of work. And I remember seeing an interview once that he gave, and he said that, you know, the mentality, like the black mama mentality or his mentality, you could, you could utilize that in any profession, any field, whether you're a writer, whether you're a painter, whether you're a, you know, a, a, whatever it is a, in life, a, a nurse, a doctor, a physician, a, you know, whatever you are in whatever field, if you just work hard, show work ethic, be present, it goes a long way. And so for me, that's what I gravitated toward early on. And obviously seeing him as a player display that, I mean, that was a motivation day in and day out for sure life in the in the bubble right now i just want to move it forward to a, a couple questions now uh, what are you hearing about life in the nba bubble right now as we get closer to starting these games back up yeah lo life in the bubble there's not much i mean because because in terms of what these guys can really do it's really restrictive and it's restrictive because the nba has really put an emphasis on health and safety and so um right now they've got some activities that they can do but it's a lot of spending time with your teammates spending time in your room obviously but when you're outside your room three hour window for practices you have to do your testing you might be able to spend time with your teammates going fishing or or or, or going to the pool um you know there, there's not that much that the obviously you can't leave campus you have to stay on campus at all times so right now i think i think this week was the big week i had one gm tell me if we can get through this week we'll be fine because starting next week um or you know when this piece runs starting this week Players will be playing in scrimmage games, you know, and once they get into that daily routine of games, um, especially starting July 30th, once these guys get into uh, routine of games and then the playoffs, like they'll be able to focus in on their real in-season grind and schedule. And your routine obviously changes a little bit. I mean, usually this would be your season, right? Free agency in, in July. Uh, what has your process been like during this pandemic? Pandemic, not having games, um, you know, access to, to players for reporting and, and other folks around the league. Uh, I imagine you have to adjust just like everybody else with, with certain things. Yeah, for me, you know, my work hasn't fully, you know, totally changed because, you know, I can still work out from my home office. You know, as long as I have my phone and my laptop, that's what helps me. But you're right, like not being able to go cover games, spend time with people in person because of coronavirus and the pandemic and everything that's going on. Um, that removes a major part of the job because, you know, part a big part of what I do is going out and seeing people at games or going and covering games, going to events, you know, the draft combine, the draft lottery, the draft, um, you know, Portsmouth Invitational in April. Like a lot of events this year have gotten canceled. Summer League is another event that probably will be going on right now. And so for me, um, that's something that I miss to this day, not being able to go and experience events like that. But um, obviously, we're in a surreal time, both from the coronavirus and health standpoint, but also you know the racial and social injustices that have gone on in the country. And so, you know, hopefully we can we can all get better from it, and we can continue to grind and 
and uh, take steps every single day to, to get on the other side of it. And then final thing, Shams, LA, a lot of people think basketball capital of the world, you got the Clippers and Lakers uh, equipped to, to try to get to the NBA finals and win it. Um, what do you think it's going to be like seeing the Lakers and Clippers with, with frankly, rested superstars on, on both sides as the Clippers try to get their first title and the Lakers try to get number 17? I think it's going to help them. You know, going in, the Lakers had, uh, you know, an advantage. You know, when, when the hiatus uh, started on March 11th, the Lakers had the chemistry going. The Lakers had all the momentum. They had just beaten Milwaukee and, Cl and the Clippers back-to-back. -back. They had the momentum. But I think this time off, if anything, it's probably, you know, it, it's, it's created a pause and allowed the Clippers to continue to work together and gain that chemistry, I think. And I think for all these teams, it'll be interesting to monitor their chemistry. But you're right, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, the time off on their bodies, um, it, it could help them. It could provide some rust. Um, but, you know, only time will tell how these guys will seriously be impacted uh, and we'll know starting July 30th. Fantastic, man. I, I just want to ask you one thing related to your story before we leave. Just your advice to kids who are 15, 16, 17 year, years old, who, who have a dream, whether it's to be a, a basketball writer or a, a football writer or, you know, work in sales, work uh, as a doctor, a lawyer. It, what is your advice in terms of just following your passion, seeing it through and not giving up? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I get, I get asked that a lot. For me, my biggest advice would be just find something you're really, really passionate about and, and just just envision yourself doing it for your career and, and really try to specialize in it, right? And when I have people that ask me, I want, you know, I want to be a writer, how can I do it? Well, write. I think repetition is the biggest thing and that'll really allow you to know whether you, you really want to do it. You know, if you want to be a writer, you know, write. And, and that's, I probably wrote more in middle school and or, sorry, I probably wrote more in high school, junior and senior year than I do now because back then I was writing daily multiple times. And so getting the reps is very important because that then allows you to, to understand and know uh, this is what you're going to be doing for, for as long as you want this to be a career and you need to be comfortable in it and you need to be confident in it and you need to find your voice. And so that's the advice I'd give to writers specifically, but really anyone is just find what you want to do that you're passionate about and just continue to get reps in it.